By the end of this episode, learners should, one, understand the basic principles and general concepts of peripheral bypass graphs, two, be aware of unique considerations of common bypass graphs, and three, understand potential complications. A vascular bypass is a surgical procedure that uses a graft to reroute blood flow, usually around a blockage caused by atherosclerosis. Common sites for bypasses are the heart, where cabbage surgery is done for coronary artery disease, and the legs, for peripheral artery disease. Peripheral bypass grafts are named based on where the bypass starts, or the proximal anastomosis, and ends, or the distal anastomosis. A femoral popliteal bypass is a bypass graft from the femoral artery to the popliteal artery. Aortal bifemoral bypass is from the aorta to both femoral arteries. Ideally, bypass grafts restore adequate blood flow, are complication-free, and have a high long-term patency rate, meaning they remain open and working for many years. There are three basic elements to a successful bypass graft. One, unobstructed inflow, which is where the bypass graft is receiving blood from. Two, a good quality conduit, which is the actual graft that is being used to bypass the blockage or area of disease. And three, adequate outflow to the target artery that is receiving blood through the conduit. The inflow artery should be free of any hemodynamically significant disease, and outflow should be enough to maintain sufficient flow rates through the conduit and resolve the clinical syndrome of ischemia. The conduit or graft material used to create the bypass can be the patient's own vein or synthetic materials like Dacron or PTFE. Dacron is a knitted or woven polyester material. PTFE is short for polytetrafluoroethylene also known as Teflon. PTFE can be used below the knee, while Dacron is not. While synthetic grafts are readily available and avoid the extensive dissection needed to harvest a vein, they have an increased risk of infection, anastomotic pseudoaneurysms, neointimal hyperplasia, and thrombosis. Neointimal hyperplasia is the accumulation of cells within the graft or artery lumen, leading to narrowing or stenosis. This occurs more readily in small diameter synthetic grafts because they are more thrombogenic more prone to triggering an inflammatory response, and there is a compliance mismatch between the synthetic graft and the native artery. Deciding between whether to use a vein or a synthetic conduit typically depends on the location of the bypass graft. Synthetic grafts are preferred for larger arteries with high flow environments like the aorta and iliacs, and for infrainguinal bypasses, veins are preferred. Ideally, the greater saphenous vein is used because it has a relatively large diameter, it's long, and it's easily harvested. But if it's already been used for previous bypass surgery or it's dilated and varicosed, other options are the lesser saphenous vein or the cephalic and basilic veins in the arm. When no good quality vein is available, a synthetic graft can be used, usually PTFE. But unlike vein grafts, the durability of synthetic bypass grafts worsens the lower the distal anastomosis is. Compared to above knee bypasses, below knee synthetic bypasses have patency rates that are significantly worse. Various methods have been developed to improve this patency, such as modifying the distal anastomosis by inserting a vein cuff or patch, or using a graft coated with carbon, heparin, or other antithrombotic materials. Common peripheral bypass grafts include aortobifemoral, crossfemoral, axillofemoral or axillobifemoral, and femoral popliteal bypasses. Crossfemoral and axillofemoral grafts are considered extra-anatomic bypasses because they avoid the natural anatomic pathway of the arteries. A combination of these two bypasses is called an axillobifemoral bypass. General concepts of vascular bypass graft surgery include exposure of the vessels involved, proximal and distal vascular control, preparing the conduit or graft, and tunneling, anticoagulation, fashioning the anastomoses, reperfusion, and ensuring hemostasis. Exposure. Adequate exposure of the vessels involved is done through careful dissection of the overlying and surrounding tissue. Enough of the vessel should be exposed to allow for clamp placement and to fashion the anastomosis. Proximal and distal vascular control. This means that the major inflow and outflow vessels should be controlled with clamps or vessel loops before the artery is open to minimize blood loss. So it's important to prepare the operative field so that vascular control can be obtained at the right time which is after the vessels have been exposed, the conduit is prepared, and the patient has been anticoagulated. Vessel loops are soft silicone strings that are used for vascular control, but also to manipulate vessels for clamp placement and identify various structures. Loops are placed proximal and distal to the site of the future anastomosis. Loops are used to control small to medium-sized arteries using a double loop, called a POTS loop. 
Traction on the loop ends occludes the vessel. Small branches can be ligated with clips or silk ties, but may be preserved in the chronic ischemic limb since they're important for collateral circulation. Angled and curved vascular clamps are preferred for larger vessels and the target artery since they provide more reliable occlusion. The surgeon will identify a soft segment of the artery for clamping, since heavily calcified arteries may not occlude completely, and clamping may disrupt the plaque and damage the vessel wall. Conduit preparation. If a synthetic graft is used, the surgeon may size match it or choose a standard size. A vein graft is prepared by gently flushing it against resistance to look for any areas of leakage or stenosis and dilate it. One end of the vein is compressed manually or with a soft vascular clamp while it is flushed with heparinized saline. Tunneling. A tunnel between the inflow and outflow artery is created with specific instruments or with blunt dissection using the index fingers. Tunneling may be done before or after the proximal anastomosis. Regardless of the type of graft used, the surgeon ensures it is not twisted or kinked, especially when passing the graft through the tunnel. A vein graft may be marked for orientation to help avoid this. Anticoagulation. Before starting the anastomosis, the patient is given IV heparin, which is allowed to circulate for three to five minutes before the vessels are clamped. This is to avoid thrombosis during manipulation and exposure of the vessels. After both anastomoses are completed, a reversal agent like protamine sulfate may or may not be administered. Anastomosis. An anastomosis is a surgical connection between two structures. So this step involves connecting the graft to the inflow and outflow artery. Once the graft is prepared and the patient is anticoagulated, the vascular clamps and vessel loops are applied to occlude blood flow to the area of the anastomosis. An arteriotomy, which is a cut in the artery wall, is created with an 11 blade with care not to puncture the back wall. The arteriotomy is extended to the desired length using angled scissors. The anastomosis is usually sutured in a running fashion using a permanent monofilament suture like proline. Different methods are used to suture the anastomosis but some general rules apply. The artery is always sutured from the inside out to avoid creating an intimal flap. Knots are always tied on the outside of the vessel and never within the lumen. Sutures should be evenly spaced apart with bites placed symmetrically across the anastomosis. A double loaded suture is used, which is a suture with a needle on both ends. A standard running suture is done by suturing each needle halfway around the anastomosis to meet at the other end. Sometimes more than one double loaded suture is used. For example, the four quadrant method, which uses two double loaded sutures, each started at opposite ends of the anastomosis. Each of the four needles are sewn one quarter of the way around the anastomosis. The parachute technique is commonly used and is particularly helpful when access is difficult, such as in a deep wound or a narrow surgical field. Several running sutures are placed between the graft and the artery with them separated, so the graft is essentially hovering over the artery with the strings between them, giving the appearance of a parachute. Both ends of the sutures are then pulled to bring the graft down onto the vessel. Anastomoses can be end-to-end -end or end-to-side. In an end-to-side anastomosis, the graft end is tapered so that the angle between the graft and the vessel is 45 degrees rather than a 90 degree angle. This reduces the disturbance of flow unnecessary loss of energy, and the pressure gradient across the anastomosis. The end of the graft may be spatulated, which is done by making a short longitudinal incision and splaying the edges open. When the anastomosis is completed, the graft end looks like a cobra head rather than a V-shape. Spatulating the graft creates a wider anastomosis to reduce the risk of anastomotic narrowing. The toe and heel are the most crucial points of an end-to-side anastomosis. The toe is the point of the anastomosis that sits furthest along the vessel while the heel is the end that sits closest along the vessel. To visualize this, take your palm and place it on your lateral thigh with your elbow bent and out to the side. Your arm is the bypass graft and your leg is the outflow artery, with your hand being the distal anastomosis. The tips of your finger are the toe of the anastomosis, while your palm closest to your wrist is the heel. Proper placement of sutures at the heel and toe is very important since these locations are awkward and difficult to repair an improper placement can narrow the anastomosis and result in anastomotic leaks. Knots should not be placed at the toe or heel, since this could also narrow the anastomosis. One to two sutures before the anastomosis is complete, it should be flushed to remove any clots and debris within the lumen through the area of the unfinished anastomosis. This is done by sequentially releasing and reclamping the inflow and outflow vessels, and also using heparinized saline. First, the distal vessel is unclamped to allow back bleeding, and then it is reclamped. 
Next, the proximal inflow vessels are unclamped so that this forward flow would push any potential debris through the unfinished anastomosis. It is also flushed with heparinized saline before completing the final sutures. Reperfusion. Once the anastomoses are completed, blood flow is restored by removing the vascular clamps and vessel loops. Outflow branch vessels that are not supplying an end organ structure are unclamped first. So if there is any remaining debris, it is flushed to a less important location. Next, the inflow vessel is unclamped. And lastly, the main outflow vessel is unclamped. Hemostasis. The suture line is checked for hemostasis. Generalized oozing is expected from the systemic anticoagulation and improves with reversal agents like protamine. Needle hole bleeding is common and can be controlled with topical hemostatic agents like Surgicel and gently applying pressure. Persistent vigorous bleeding indicates a defect in the suture line, which can be stopped with a figure of eight repair stitch. And if the vessel wall is fragile, a horizontal mattress stitch with a pledgeted suture can support the repair. Complications may occur in the perioperative and postoperative period. The risk, of, the risk of complications occurring is influenced by the type of surgery and patient factors. In general, early complications include cardiac complications such as NMI, respiratory issues like pneumonia, hemorrhage, renal failure, wound complications, and injury to adjacent structures. Later complications include graft infection, graft stenosis or occlusion, and pseudoaneurysm formation at the anastomoses. Next, we'll discuss the indications for common bypass grafts, unique considerations, and complications for each. Aortal bifemoral bypass. Aortal bifemoral bypass is the gold standard for aortoiliac disease. Aortofemoral bypass is also done. However, bilateral bypass does not complicate the procedure or add to the physiological stress of the operation. And although one side may be more severely affected than the other, disease progression does occur over time. The proximal anastomosis can be end-to-end -end or end-to-side. An end-to-end -end anastomosis allows straight, in-line, and theoretically less turbulent flow. It is preferred if the patient has a concurrent abdominal aneurysm to exclude the aneurysm from circulation. Since the distal aorta is oversown, leaving a stump, pelvic perfusion is dependent on retrograde flow from the external iliacs and from proximal lumbar and mesenteric collaterals. An end-to-side anastomosis is preferred if the external iliacs are occluded, but the internal iliacs are patent to maintain blood flow to the pelvis. This also preserves the inferior mesenteric artery, which can be an important source of collateral blood flow to the pelvis. If the pelvis is devascularized, there is increased risk of impotence, post-op colon ischemia, buttock ischemia, and paraplegia from spinal cord ischemia. The key to optimizing the durability of the aortobifemoral bypass graft is adequate outflow. First, the femoral arteries are exposed with bilateral groin incisions to ensure they are adequate for the distal anastomosis. Then the aorta is exposed, usually through a midline laparotomy. In certain situations, the retroperitoneal approach with the flank incision is preferred, such as if the patient has a colostomy or has had numerous abdominal surgeries. After retracting the small bowel and transverse colon, the ligament of trites is taken down to retract the duodenum and the retroperitoneum over the aorta is opened. Before dissecting free the proximal aorta from the surrounding tissue, the left renal vein is identified crossing over top. A non-calcified, minimally diseased segment of the infrarenal aorta is identified for clamping when needed. A retroperitoneal tunnel is created with blunt dissection, proximally, over the common femoral artery, careful not to injure the crossing circumflex iliac vein, and distally, from the abdomen, along the iliac vessels, while lifting the colon and ureter out of the way. After the patient is heparinized, the aorta is clamped. Only a proximal clamp is needed if the distal aorta is completely occluded. For an end-to-side anastomosis, a side-biting clamp can be used. Once the proximal anastomosis is complete, the limbs of the graft are passed through the previously created retroperitoneal tunnels. The distal anastomosis is often at the bifurcation of the common femoral artery and extended onto the profunda femoris. When re-establishing blood flow, the patient is monitored for hypotension, which may occur especially when unclamping the aorta. Hemostasis is obtained and pulses are checked in both groins. The presence of a pulse or Doppler signal in the feet is confirmed. Then all wounds are closed in layers. The retroperitoneum is carefully reapproximated over the graft to prevent a graft enteric fistula at the proximal suture line or erosion of the small bowel into the graft. This complication is rare but life-threatening. Next, we'll discuss cross-femoral and axillofemoral bypass. These extra anatomic bypasses were developed as alternatives to direct aortofemoral bypass for patients at high surgical risk, such as elderly patients with uncorrectable cardiac or severe pulmonary disease, or patients with a hostile abdomen 
such as those with an intra-abdominal infection or extensive adhesions from prior abdominal surgery. Although extra anatomic bypasses avoid a more extensive procedure and the associated complications, this comes at the price of limited durability. Cross-femoral bypass is a bypass between the femoral arteries. Since the tunnel is created suprapubically, a potential but rare complication is bladder injury. Since this bypass relies on the donating artery to supply blood flow to both legs, ideally, the iliac and femoral artery providing inflow are disease-free. In bilateral disease, with a flow-limiting lesion in the inflow artery, there may be an increased risk of developing Steele syndrome, where the patient experiences worsening symptoms and a decrease in their ABI in the donor leg. Inflow disease may be treated with angioplasty and stenting. Another option is to provide inflow from the axillary artery, called an axillobifemoral bypass. Axillofemoral and axillobifemoral bypass. The axillary artery is usually a good inflow artery since it is often spared from atherosclerosis. It is exposed through an infraclavicular incision. A subcutaneous tunnel is created from the axillary artery under the pectoralis minor muscle, anterior to the mid-axillary line, down towards the ipsilateral femoral artery. The suprapubic tunnel is also created if the surgeon is doing an axillobifemoral bypass. Generally, the cross-femoral graft is placed first, and then the axillofemoral graft is anastomosed to this graft. Another approach is to do the opposite, where the axillofemoral graft is placed first, and then the cross-femoral component is completed. Brachial plexus injury is a complication unique to bypasses involving the axillary artery. Since both cross-femoral and axillofemoral bypasses are subcutaneous, there is a risk of external compression which could lead to thrombosis. Femoral popliteal bypass. A femoral popliteal bypass, or FEMPOP, is indicated for superficial femoral disease. Vein grafts can be in situ or reversed. A reverse saphenous vein graft is when the vein is entirely excised and reversed in orientation, which renders the valves non-functional. The graft is tunneled under the sartorius muscle. An in situ bypass is when the greater saphenous vein is mobilized only at its proximal and distal ends, requiring less dissection than the reversed vein graft. However, valves must be cut out using a valvulotome, which could potentially damage the intima. If the outflow artery is the above knee popliteal artery, an incision is made in the lower medial thigh, superior to the sartorius muscle, and below the vastus medialis. The sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus muscles are reflected posteriorly, while the adductor magnus is retracted anteriorly to expose the adductor canal. If the outflow artery is the below knee popliteal artery, the incision is made one centimeter behind the medial tibial condyle and along the posterior edge of the tibia. The medial head of the gastrocnemius is retracted downwards while the soleus is lifted up. The popliteal artery is typically surrounded by two veins with the tibial nerve posterior to it. A quick summary of the fundamental principles of vascular bypass surgery. 1. Adequate exposure of the involved arteries through careful dissection, making sure to protect adjacent structures. 2. Gaining vascular control. Arteries are encircled with vessel loops. Appropriate clamps are chosen, and smaller branches may be ligated with clips or silk The ties. arteries clamped proximal and distal to the anastomosis after the patient is anticoagulated. Anticoagulation is important to prevent thrombosis. When passing the graft through the tunnel, it is important to ensure that there is no twisting or kinking. The anastomosis are sutured in a running fashion, and they should be flushed prior to completion to remove potential debris, clots, and air. Vessel loops and clamps are removed to re-establish blood flow. The suture line is checked for hemostasis. Surgicel, gentle direct pressure, reversal with protamine are usually sufficient, but a defect in the suture line may require additional stitches.